to warn her about a future event. Uh, you're talking about two children there. <coughs> There's one the child in the van, um, and and the, the village itself was very aware that that slack heap was moving, and they did report it. They were afraid, and they felt as if there was movement on the slack heap. Oh, interesting. Now, if the child picked that from the parents at the time, yeah. and again, with the energy that was surrounding, there's a possibility that then once again project something mm -hmm. happening. Yeah, yeah, um, I can, I can yeah. yeah, no, I can buy into that. I think that is as, as, as interesting a possibility. And indeed, maybe the, the psychic dissonance or whatever per, word of the field, again, could have been picked up by Joyce Donoghue or an element of Joyce Donoghue, mm. which, is the, which is the central point I'll be coming to in a second. Mm. I then moved on um, to another area and near-death experience. Because I thought that if it is to do with memory, and if deja vu is something to do with memory, is there any elements to show that we in some way record our memories in some possible way? And I, went, I became involved in, in near-death experience and joined the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which gave me access to a lot of research papers and such like. And I started really getting quite fascinated by particular elements of the near-death experience particularly something termed the panoramic life review. You know, the idea of my life flashed before my eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's not that uncommon, that's like the, the panoramic life review. But statistically, it is interesting, and I've had this verified by, by doctors I've spoken to who have been involved in the death experience. And indeed, a lady, when I did a talk in Macclesfield, it was a doctor that said, this is quite interesting because we've been fascinated by this fact as well. And the interesting thing is that the near-death experience, when you have a panoramic life review, statistically is more likely to happen if you're in circumstances where, whereby you know you're going to die. Skydivers, people who are drowning, people in car crashes. It's, it's rarely recorded with people who are aware that they have a terminal illness and they're in hospital. It's as if it takes place when the something within the subconscious knows that death is inevitable and is going to be taking place very soon. Now, the interesting thing about the panoramic life review is the fact that it flashes before their eyes. It's a very consistent thing, you know, it's as if something is, a recording has been fast, fast forwarded in some way in front of the, the people's vision. I was also intrigued by another element which is called the, um, the, being, the, 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 the being of light. It's like a greeter, uh, uh, when people are starting to die, they have a sense of a presence, a sense of presence. And indeed, you're probably aware of a lot of the work that's being done by Michael Persinger at the Laurentian University in Sudbury in Ontario. And he's managed to replicate the feeling of sense presence with ultrasonics and stimulating the brain in particular ways. So we have the feeling that we're not alone. And when somebody is in the process of dying, it seems that this sense presence might even be able to project itself into vision to make us feel at ease. Because one of the most fascinating things about near-death experiences is how culturally biased they are. Depending upon your belief system depends on what the being of light is. You know, a, a, a Christian will see Jesus. Somebody else may see their mother or father. Somebody may see another religious figure from their particular belief system. And indeed there are cases where people even see their pet dog. Or a general being. It's as if there is something there that is trying to put you at ease in some way or other. To help you through a very traumatic experience. One of the areas that particularly fascinated me about near death experience was this idea of my life flashing before my eyes. And if that is the case, could it possibly be that memories are stored and recorded in some way? Now, has anybody here heard of the guy Wilder Penfield? I guess we will be you. Now, Wilder Penfield was a fascinating guy. He was born in Wilkes Bar in the USA in 1891. And he had a younger sister who died of complications due to epilepsy. And Penfield really wanted to find a cure for epilepsy. And he trained to be a neurosurgeon. And he, he moved up to Canada, and he lived in Montreal, in the um, Neurological Institute in Montreal. Now, Penfield, at that time, was very aware of the fact that playing around with the brain in any shape or form could be very, very dangerous for a patient. But he needed to know 
what parts of the brain did. For a very simple reason. He wanted to bring about an operation whereby you could find where the epilepsy started, the locus point of the epilepsy, where it starts and spreads out through the brain. And his logic was that if you could find that point, you could cut round the area of the brain where it starts, and in doing so, isolate the electrical storm. Mm -hmm. Rather like a forest fire, when they, they, they dig trenches and put water or sand in them. The principle was the same. The major problem Penfield had was, of course, we don't know, or at that stage, they didn't know what part of the brain did what. And you can't just start cutting bits of somebody's brain out, because you don't know what damage you're going to do. So what Penfield had to do was to devise a method whereby he could map the brain and find out what parts of the brain did what. He was aware, as, as neurosurgeons are, and as most medical people are, that the brain itself doesn't feel pain, whereas the skull does and, and, and the flesh does. So effectively, by putting a local anaesthetic on somebody's skull, you can in fact operate and manipulate the exposed cortex of somebody who is conscious. And this is exactly what Penfield did. And here is a photograph taken from, by people who worked with Penfield, showing somebody's exposed cortex. And what Penfield used to do, and this is another diagram from one of Penfield's books, is he had a small electrode pen with a very, very small electrical charge. And what he would do, he would place it onto the exposed cortex of the patient and ask the patient what they were perceiving or what they felt. And if the person turned around and said, I've just had a flash of red light, he'd come to the conclusion that was something to do with the visionary cortex. And over a period of time, he was able to map the surface of the brain so he knew what parts did what, so he knew which areas he could cut out. But of course the danger is that one was never sure whether every person's brain was identical. But effectively he drew up something called a Penfield diagram, which is a little fantastic homunculus showing how the brain perceives things. As he worked his way around the brain, and he did the parietal cortex and the frontal cortex, and the frontal lobe, and then he moved to the temporal lobes, which are the areas that are situated around the ears. And he started on the exposed brain of a middle-aged uh, middle patient and placed the electrode onto her brain. As he placed the electrode onto her brain, she turned around and she said, most peculiar. And he said, what? And she said, I know I'm in an operating theatre in, in Montreal, but I also know something else. I'm back in my kitchen 17 years ago. I'm really back there. And he said, what, you're remembering it? She said, no, it's a three-dimensional image. I'm actually in my kitchen. I can feel the wind coming in through the window. She moved, in this three-dimensional recreation of her past, she moved forward to the window, and she could hear her neighbours arguing, word for word, from an argument that happened 17 years before. She then turned around and she said, good Lord, it's Johnny. And she could hear her son calling her. At this stage, Penfield was really fascinated, took the electrode away and asked her what she was experiencing. She said it suddenly had stopped. After he distracted her, asking her about Johnny and what Johnny was doing, he placed the electrode back on the same point of the temporal lobe and was able to evoke the same imagery from the point he'd taken the electrode off, i.e. as if he'd interrupted some kind of movie and then he'd started it again, like he'd put it on pause and then fast forward. This operation and this exercise, he reproduced many, many times. And towards the end of his life, he wrote a wonderful book. And one of the quotations in there, he said that he was absolutely convinced that given certain circumstances, that the brain records everything. And that that can be evoked given certain times. Now, I have been informed as well that these operations have continued... And indeed, I know that a guy called Delgado worked in the 70s, a guy called Halgren, I think, in the 80s. But I did a, a talk recently, a private talk rather like this, and I met a, a neurosurgeon that had been working in the Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool. And he was telling me that he had re reproduced these effects in the 1980s. And again, the same kind of thing, of the, the evoking of a memory and a past life memory in, in a three-dimensional way. Now, coincidentally, um, I, at that stage, had got in contact with a gentleman by the name of Carl Pribram. And Carl Pribram is a professor of, I think it's psychology, or was, at the University of Georgetown. And Carl has a fascinating theory that memory works on the process of holograms.